All right, so we're going to look at chapter 6, which has to do with um, bonding, okay, chemical bonding. Bonding. So can someone tell me what a chemical bond is? What do we know about a chemical bond? Uh-huh. Um, Two types of chemical bonds, and the sharing of electrons is one specific type. So I'm going to give you the overall definition of a chemical bond, then we're going to break it down into each of those two types. Okay? So a chemical bond, this is the definition for a chemical bond. A mutual attraction between the nuclei and valence electrons. of different atoms, okay, a mutual attraction between the nuclei and the valence electron of different atoms. So what does nuclei mean? Yeah. Yeah, nuclei in itself means multiple nucleus, right? So we've got multiple nucleus here that's, that's attracting, but yes, in the nucleus contains what? Protons and neutrons. So what's the overall charge of a nucleus? It's a positively charged part, right? It's a part, positively charged part of our atom because it contains protons, which are positively charged, and neutrons, which are neutral. They're not charged, okay? Remind me what valence electrons are. Outer shell, good. Valence electrons are the electrons available for bonding in the outer shell. So if you need to make an extra little note about that in, in your uh, notes, that might be a good idea to remind yourself what valence electrons are. They're the available electrons to bond in the outermost shell. Okay, so here we've got an atom, uh, two atoms that are attracting each other uh, with the nucleus of one and valence electrons of another. They're going to start coming together. Okay, question two main types. Yeah, Caroline, can you give me one? A covalent bond. Very good. Let's talk about covalent first. So a covalent bond. What happens in a covalent bond? Mm -hmm. Good. Covalent bonds are when atoms share those electrons. And something to note here is sometimes they share them equally. And sometimes they don't. Sometimes they share those electrons equally, and sometimes they share them unequally, okay? The other type of chemical bond is an ionic bond. Very good. And can you tell me what happens in ionic bonds? Yeah? Yeah, they give and take, okay? So an ionic bond, there's no sharing. They're going to completely give or take. Okay, and we know this is how I abbreviate electrons, right? E with a little minus sign. Okay, that means electrons. Just a shorter way to write it out. So ionic bonds mean they completely give or take of their electrons. Okay, ionic bonds, very important for you to know this part. Ionic bonds are between a metal and what else? And a non-metal. Good, we talked about... Ionic compounds being between a metal and a non-metal. The same goes for bonds. Okay, Ionic bonds must be between a metal and a non-metal, or you can think of it as between a cation and an anion. Okay, You can think of it either way, between a cation and an anion, or between a metal and a non-metal. Okay, So ionic bonds have to come one from either side of the periodic table.
Okay, so covalent bonds are between two nonmetals. Ionic bonds are between uh, a metal and a nonmetal. Okay, so those gives us a kind of overall depiction of what these bonds look like, but it's really all about the sharing of electrons or transfer of electrons. Okay, we usually have covalent bonds uh, that are somewhere between. They're usually not perfectly shared or perfectly separated. We kind of fall somewhere in between on those bonds, okay? Usually they're not shared equally or they're usually not taken or given completely, okay? So we have something called the Pauling scale that we look at. So the Pauling scale is that half periodic table that I gave you as a handout that's on the back side of molecular geometry. Can you find that handout for me? Okay, it was a handout that I gave you last semester, and on one side there's a half sheet of periodic table that has values on it, electronegativity values, and the other side has molecular geometry. You need to have that handout this semester. Okay, Pauling scale, P-A-U-L-I-N-G. If you want to write that at the top, you can so you remember. These are electronegativity values. Okay, that's what the Pauling scale tells us, is how electronegative a certain atom is. Okay, do we remember what the term electronegativity means? Have we talked about that briefly? Not really. Okay. Um, not really. Electronegativity tells us how badly an element wants to take electrons from someone else. Okay, so electronegativity tells us you can put this part in your notes. Um, how bad an element wants to take electrons. Okay, how badly an element wants to take electrons from something else is its electronegativity value. So on your Pauling scale, can you tell me which of those elements is the most electronegative? Fluorine. Fluorine, good. We've talked about that before. Fluorine is the most electronegative. It's got really, really close shell to the nucleus, and it's got seven valence electrons. So it wants one electron really, really badly, and it's going to do everything it can to take that electron from someone else. So fluorine is the most electronegative atom, okay? So what this electronegativity table tells us, or the Pauling scale tells us, it's going to give us a range for our our bonds, our covalent bonds. So here we're going to talk a little bit more exclusively about covalent bonds. Okay, we gave you the definition, now we're going to look at them a little bit more in depth. Okay, so if I have a covalent bond between two atoms, if I have a covalent bond, let's say, between um, nitrogen and hydrogen. Okay, if I have a covalent bond between these two atoms, I want to determine, are these electrons being shared equally, or are they being shaded one way or the other, okay? And that's what the electronegativity table tells us, or the Pauling scale tells us. It can tell us if this bond <clears throat> is purely covalent, which means it's shared evenly, or if it's what we call polar covalent, okay? So if we have something called a polar covalent bond... That means we have electrons that are not shared evenly. Okay, so they're not shared evenly within a bond. Okay, this polar covalent means that it's it's an uneven distribution of electrons or these electrons are not shared evenly. Okay, whereas if we have just a regular perfectly covalent bond, if we have a perfect covalent bond or a nonpolar covalent bond, that means electrons are shared evenly within the bond. 
Okay, so now we've got two types of bonds, and we're going to take a look at our electronegativity values for each of these atoms. The electronegativity value from the Pauling scale of nitrogen is 3.04, and the electronegativity of hydrogen is 2.20. So within that molecule, which of these elements wants the electrons more? Nitrogen. So if I was going to shade, if my electrons were going to shade one way or the other, which way would they probably shade toward? nitrogen okay my my electrons would shade toward the nitrogen side so within this bond we might have electrons that are both located on this side of the bond okay they might be going closer to that nitrogen the nitrogen pulling them tighter to itself okay this is a pretty a generic description of covalent bonds and polar covalent bonds but I want you to kind of see what's happening here does that kind of make sense polar covalent, so when they're shared unevenly, and that's what we have here, okay? So on page 176 in your textbooks, uh, it gives us some examples and some values for when our electronegativities are, are different enough to give us a polar covalent bond or an ionic bond. If they're so different, um, if one is pulling electrons so much towards itself, we might consider it an ionic bond. Okay, and so these are some values here on page 176 um, that tells us where we reach the ionic range, where we're in the polar covalent range, and where we're in the nonpolar covalent range. And that's that blue and green kind of shaded box on the left. Do we see that? Okay, so if our difference in electronegativities is between 0.3 and 1.7, we've got a polar covalent bond. Okay, so let's go ahead and look at the difference between these values, 3.04 minus 2.20. What do we get for that value? Oops, oops. It's been a long time since I've had to do. 0.84? Yeah? Okay. It falls under a polar covalent bond. Okay, our electrons are shared unevenly, but they're still kind of close enough in value that they're considered shared. Okay, if I were to look at, can I get rid of this slide? Okay, if I were to look at a bond between, let's say, um, calcium and fluorine, if I were to look at this bond right here, let's go ahead and look at our electronegativity values. Our electronegativity value for calcium is what? 1.0. And what's the electronegativity value of fluorine? 3.98. Okay. So if we subtract, we find the difference in our electronegativity values, 3.98 minus 1.0 gives us a 2.98 difference in electronegativity. What type of bond does that fall under? Ionic. Can we tell from this bond itself that it's an ionic bond? Yes. Why can we tell that it's an ionic bond? It's a metal and a non-metal. Okay? So the math proves it with electronegativity, but we should be able to see it with our atoms anyway. Okay? Go ahead and put those ranges into your notes, okay? So it's an ionic bond if the difference in electronegativity is between 3.3 and 1.7. I want you to go ahead and put that kind of, those information into your notes, okay? And you can organize it ho however you'd like, but that figure two on page 176, try to get that into your notes so you have the ranges there. Look at now a bond between hydrogen and sulfur, and I want you to determine what type of a bond this would be. Ionic a polar covalent or a nonpolar covalent? Two point. Eight, and the electronegativity value for hydrogen is 2.20. So if we take 2.58 minus 2.20, 0.38, which leaves us with what type of a bond? 
polar covalent. That means these electrons within this bond are shared unevenly. And which of these two elements would those elements kind of, I'm sorry, would those electrons shade towards? Sulfur. Okay, so if I had to picture my electrons within this bond, can you tell me how many electrons are in each bond? Do you remember? Have we talked about that yet? No? Okay, we're going to talk about that today. There's two electrons in every bond. Okay, so we've got two electrons to represent here, one from hydrogen and one from sulfur. So realistically, our electrons might be closer to the sulfur side. Okay, if I'm drawing my bond here, my electrons might realistically be located both on this sulfur side of it instead of evenly like this. Okay, but that's what we're looking at here. Our electrons are shading toward our sulfur side. Okay. Let's take a look now at the bond between sulfur and chlorine. And I want you to go ahead and do hydrogen and hydrogen. Okay, so go ahead and do both of these on your own, and I want you to tell me what types of bonds they're going to be. Okay, when we have a bond between two of the same atoms or two of the same element, we should automatically know that's going to be nonpolar. Did we all recognize that off, like without having to do the math? Okay. If we have a bond between two atoms that are exactly identical, they're going to both pull on that electron with equal strength. Right? They both want the electron just as badly as the other one. So that means those electrons have to be shared evenly within that bond. They're both going to kind of pull on it with the same weight. So if you think about these bonds kind of as a tug of war, the most electronegative one's going to win. If we've got two people with the same strength pulling on that rope, it's not going to go anywhere. Okay, we've got the same, a balanced bond, which is a nonpolar bond. Okay, questions there? We're good calculating if it's an ionic, polar, or a nonpolar. Yeah? Okay, good. So to continue talking about covalent bonds, we want to make sure that we understand covalent bonds share electrons. Okay, they are sharing. Okay, and so what they're going to do is they want to share electrons until they complete what we call the octet. Okay, do you remember what the octet rule is? Okay, the octet rule tells us that each atom wants to share electrons so that both contain eight electrons in their outer shell. Okay, the octet rule tells us each atom wants to share electrons so that both atoms within that bond can complete their octet or have eight electrons in their outermost shell. Okay, so when two atoms go to share electrons, they want to share efficiently enough uh, that they kind of complete each other's octet, right? So sweet, okay? They want to make sure that each of those atoms has eight electrons in their outer shell, whether they're valence electrons as lone pairs or whether they are in a bond, okay? And we're going to talk about how we, how we look at those lone pairs and things like that. But this is our octet rule. We want each atom to have eight electrons. That's really important, eight electrons, okay? Hence the name octet. There's a few exceptions to the octet rule, and so I'm going to give you just a couple exceptions here. Some atoms and some elements are okay with not having eight electrons. Okay, They're okay with not fulfilling their octet, or they might be okay with having more than eight electrons surrounding them. Okay, So here's a few exceptions. Boron is an exception. Phosphorus is an exception. Nitrogen is an exception. Okay, arsenic is an exception. I'm just giving you some pretty generic ones that we see used often. There's more that could be exceptions to the octet rule, but these are ones that we see often as an exception. Okay, tell me how many valence electrons boron has. You might need your regular periodic table out if you don't have that out already. Three, right? It's in group three or 13, 
So it has three valence electrons. That means it has three electrons in its outermost shell that it has available to bond. So sometimes it's okay with only having three valence electrons used. It's okay with only being bonded to three things instead of four. Um, whereas phosphorus and nitrogen and arsenic, how many, how many valence electrons do they have? Five, right? Yeah, they're in group five. They're in group five. So they have five valence electrons available to bond. They might be able to have ten electrons along the outside of their, uh, in their outer shell. Okay, and that's okay. So some of these uh, have exceptions, but for the most part, we want things to have eight electrons around the outside. And we're going to talk about what that looks like here with our Lewis structures. But here's a couple just exceptions to our octet rule. Okay? So just be kind of aware of these different elements. All right, let's now look at what we call Lewis structures. This is a big, big part of Chapter 6. This is kind of your main um, main chunk of chapter six. Okay, so these are called Lewis structures. Okay, and Lewis structures are 2D representations of molecules. Okay, they're a 2D flat picture of what we think a molecule looks like. Okay. What Lewis structures do is they give us the ability to look at these compounds in a two-dimensional way uh, by, viewing all the comp by viewing all the elements, all the atoms in a compound, and by viewing all electrons. Okay, so we're looking at how these atoms are going to share electrons, uh, what's going to be left over, all that kind of stuff within a compound. Okay. So when we draw these Lewis structures, we're going to start with a singular atom when it's not bonded to anything, okay? So let's start with looking at oxygen, okay? My oxygen molecule, I represent with an O because that's what its symbol is, okay? If I was looking at a fluorine molecule, I'd start with a fluorine in the middle, okay? This isn't like a circle. This is a letter O, okay? Are we clear there? Okay. Okay. So oxygen has how many valence electrons? It has six valence electrons. Okay, we know that because it's in group six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, it has six valence electrons. So we're going to represent these electrons with dots. Okay, that's why it's sometimes called electron dot notation. And we're going to go around. So we have one, two, three, four. Then we start pairing them up. Five, six. Okay, so oxygen has six valence electrons available to bond. Okay, six valence electrons available to bond, and that's what they look like. Sometimes you'll see um, books put the, the pairs on opposite ends. It really does not make a difference for a singular atom. Okay, I'm not going to be picky about that. Um, but we want to represent six electrons. We don't draw them just spaced out around the atom. That's not how it works, right? Because we want electrons to be in pairs as much as possible. So we want to pair them up, okay? And the reason we don't just make them a pair and leave it like this is because it's unbalanced, okay? So we want our atom to be as balanced as we can, but in pairs when we can too, okay? So I know it's a little bit tricky. All right, so this is the electron dot notation for oxygen, right here, okay? So if I wanted to look at the electron dot notation for fluorine, how many valence electrons does fluorine have available to bond? Seven. It has seven. So we're going to start one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. It's got one electron left over, so it really, really wants another electron there to complete its octet. Okay? And it can take that electron by sharing it with another. It can take it away completely. How many electrons does oxygen need to complete its octet? Two. It needs two electrons. Very good. You go ahead and draw carbon and neon. I want you to draw the electron dot notation for carbon and neon. And we call it electron dot. Your book calls it this uh, for when it's a singular atom. Okay, this is what our carbon and our neon dot structures should look like. Okay. How many total electrons does neon have? Total electrons, not just valence electrons. How many total? It has 10, but how many do we see depicted here? 
8. And why do we only show 8? Exactly. Those are its valence electrons. These are the only eight electrons available to bond. Yes, within its inner shell, it's got two more, but they're not available to bond. So we only draw, we only represent the valence electrons. So if I would get down to chlorine, chlorine's one more row down, right? Chlorine has how many total <laughs> electrons? How many? 17. But when we draw chlorine's dot structure, we only draw seven, okay? Because those are the seven available to bond on that chlorine atom. Is that making sense so far? All right, now we're going to take it to the, the fun part where we look at Lewis structures of more than one atom, okay? So let's start with two fluorine atoms. I want to look at a Lewis structure for two fluorine atoms. Okay, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and draw their dot notation for each of those. For each of those molecules. And I'm going to put one in a different color, sorry. So we can see it a little bit more clearly. So here's our two individual fluorine molecules. When those start to bond, what's going to happen with those electrons? Are they going to be shared or are they going to be given completely? Shared. shared. Why, are they, why do we know they're going to be shared? Yeah, same, it's the same atom, number one, and it's, they're both nonmetals, so we know it has to be a covalent bond. Okay? That didn't work like I wanted it to. Sorry, give me just one second. All right, never mind. <laughs> so if I move this over and I look at my blue fluorine, what's happening here with this section of our, of our structure? We've got one electron from each, right? A valence electron from the green fluorine and a valence electron from the blue fluorine. Those two electrons that are shared form a bond. Okay, and we draw a bond with a single line. Does each of those fluorines still have six outer electrons available to bond? Yes, so we still include those other valence electrons. But we know within this bond here, there are two electrons, one from the green fluorine and one from the blue fluorine, okay? So now we check to see if each of these atoms has completed its octet, okay? So our fluorine on the right has two, four, six electrons plus two more in this bond, which gives us eight, okay? Same on this left side, two, four, six, and eight. Both of the atoms get to count those two electrons as their own for the octet. Okay, does that make sense? Both of them get to count it. So these sets of outer electrons, do we know what this little set of electrons is called? Um, they sit in an orbital, but these sets are called lone pairs. Lone pairs, that's really important. Okay, lone pairs are, is a pair of electrons that are available to bond. Okay, we like things to be in pairs, electrons to be in pairs. We won't ever have one single electron hanging out here by itself. That doesn't work. That's called a radical. Okay, and we don't, we don't like that. We have to have electrons in pairs. So these out here are called lone pairs. Okay. Are represented. How many total electrons are represented in this diagram? Six. Two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, fourteen. There are fourteen electrons represented here. Okay, each of these gets to count the bond for its octet count, but we don't count it twice because we know there's only two electrons located within that bond. Okay, the total number of electrons that's represented in a diagram should equal the total number of valence electrons available.
Okay, so for each fluorine, how many, how many valence electrons did each of our fluorines have available? Seven, right? They each had seven, so we should represent 14 electrons somewhere on our diagram, and that's what we have. Two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, fourteen. Okay, so the bond gets counted as two electrons when we're looking at the total number of electrons, but it gets counted for each when we're looking at the octet rule. Okay, does that make sense? Kind of. Okay, so in this bond is two electrons. All right, let's try some more. Pictures. All right, step one. First thing that we need to do is uh, determine the number of valence electrons. Okay, that's how I write valence electrons. For each atom. Then add to find the total. For the molecule. Okay, so we wanted we determined there that fluorine, each fluorine had seven valence electrons, but total we had 14 that we needed to represent. So that's gonna be our first step from now on, is counting the number of valence electrons. Okay. Our next step is going to be um, arrange our atoms in what we call a skeleton. Okay, and the skeleton is going to be our atoms with no electrons or bonds or anything drawn in. Okay, so we're going to arrange our atoms in, in our what we call our skeleton. Okay, so again, I'm going to walk you through all these steps, and then we're going to do some practice where we put the steps in order. So it's okay if these don't quite make sense to you just yet. Okay. So we're going to put our atoms into a skeleton. So these are how we kind of determine what, where our skeleton goes or what our skeleton looks like. Okay, so for the skeleton, if you have carbon, it almost always goes in the middle or is the central atom. Okay, central atom. So it almost always gets to go in the middle. Okay, carbon is almost always a central atom. That's important. Okay, if you don't have carbon, the least electronegative The least electronegative atom is the central atom. Okay, so if we've got carbon, it gets to go in the center. If not, we look for our least electronegative atom, and it gets to go in the center. Okay? Um, and I want to make another note to tell you hydrogen is never a central atom. Okay, hydrogen never gets to go in the center because hydrogen only has one electron. It, it can only bond to one thing, so it can't go in the center. Okay, it can only be bonded to one thing, so we can't put it in the center. Okay. All right, those are our rules for skeleton. Next, after we've got our skeleton drawn, sorry, is everyone good there? Okay, after we've got our skeleton drawn, our next step is going to be to bond the central atom 
to each outside atom. and fill in all electrons. Okay, I wanna make a note here. Remember that we might have multiple bonds, which I'll show you how to use in just a second. Remember, uh, we could have multiple bonds or lone pairs. All right, so now that we've gone through our rules, now we can start putting them into action and you can kind of see where we're going. Okay, so I know these rules seem pretty abstract right now and they don't uh, really make sense, but we're gonna walk through uh, some examples that show us here, okay? So let's try some examples. Let's start with a molecule of NH3. NH3. Okay, our first step is to do what? We want to count valence electrons. So how many valence electrons does nitrogen have? Five, good. And hydrogen has one, and we have three of those hydrogens. Okay, so this means we need to represent eight electrons somewhere in our diagram. Okay, we have to have eight electrons represented because that's how many we have available. Are we clear on that part? Okay, good. So now our next step start to, is to start to draw our skeleton. Which of these atoms should be our central atom? <laughs> nitrogen, good, because we know hydrogen is never a central atom, so that only leaves us with nitrogen. Okay, and generally, whatever atom there's the fewest of would be our central atom, okay, in general, okay. So now we're going to arrange them in what we call a skeleton. So we're going to put N here, and then we're going to space our hydrogens out pretty evenly around that nitrogen molecule. For now, the spacing of it doesn't really make a difference. We are going to get into three-dimensional shapes of it a little bit later, but for now, not really concerned with the shape, okay. Just space them as evenly as we can. So here's our skeleton step. Are we good there? All right, now we're going to start adding electrons. So we're going to add our bonds. We have to have a bond for each of these um, three hydrogens. So we're going to take bond here, bond here, and bond here. Okay. How many electrons have I just used with those three bonds? I've used six electrons. So that means I'm going to subtract six, which means I have two electrons left. Okay, so now we start thinking about where can we put those two electrons? Does it go on any of our hydrogens? No, because hydrogen only has one valence electron. Hydrogen should never have a lone pair, ever, ever, ever. Okay, so what's the only other option to put our two electrons? On the nitrogen, so we're going to put them, stick them right here. Okay, as a pair. Remember, we don't separate them. This is no good to have it look like that. Okay, we don't separate them. We keep them as a lone pair. Okay, and the very, very last step, which I guess you should probably write in your rules, is to check the octets. We want to check the octet for each of our atoms. Hydrogen does not get an octet. Okay, hydrogen only can be bonded to one thing. Uh huh. Yes, yes, that's the only time when we do dot notation. Mm -hmm. Yep. So now we're going to check nitrogen's octet. How many electrons can we count for nitrogen right here? Two, four, and eight. So nitrogen's octet is complete. Hydrogen is, should only be bonded to one thing, so each of those are good. And we used up all of our electrons, so this is a complete Lewis structure. Okay, that's it. We've checked our octet, we used all of our possible electrons, and all of our hydrogens look good. If I ever see a something that looks like this, okay, I'm going to draw this in a different color so we know it's bad. If we ever see something like this, or something like this, or anything like that, 
you're going to get a big, big frowning face on your paper. Okay? Hydrogen can only be bonded to one thing. It can only have one single bond. That's it. Okay? So we want to get rid of those. Okay, here is our perfect Lewis structure. All right, let's try another one. Let's look at H2S. Do we know the name of this molecule? We do. Is it what type? Acid. It's an acid. Good. And what's it called? Hydrosulfuric acid. Perfect. Hydrosulfuric acid. Because it comes from sulfide. So it means hydrosulfuric acid. Perfect. All right. So how many valence electrons? Let's look at valence electrons here. Hydrogen has one, and we've got two of those molecules. How many does sulfur have to give up? Six. So that means we need to represent eight electrons here somewhere. Okay, you can write valence electrons if you want, but we got to have eight electrons. Which of these should be our central atom? Sulfur. Sulfur, good. So sulfur is going to go in the middle. Then we're going to draw our skeleton after that. Can everyone get that far by themselves, we think? Yeah? All right, good. Next step is to draw our bonds. So we have a bond here and a bond here. Okay. How many electrons have we used from that bond, or from each, from the bonds total? We've used four, so that means we've got four left. Where would we go about putting those four electrons? Yeah, on sulfur, so here and here. Okay, so we've used all of our eight electrons. Now we check... Are our octets complete? Do hydrogens get an octet? No. Does sulfur have a complete octet here? Two, four, six, and eight. Yes, it does. Very good. Okay. Questions? How do you feel? All right, let's try some now where we might have to take on a double bond. Okay, multiple bonds. Okay, so let's look at a molecule that looks like this, CH2O. So first step is always to count valence electrons. Carbon has four. Hydrogen has one, which is plus two. I'm sorry, which there's two of. And oxygen has six, which means we need to represent 12 electrons somewhere. <coughs> All right, which of these should be our central atom? Carbon, good. And then we're going to build our skeleton. Let's go ahead and start adding our bonds here. By adding just bonds alone, how many electrons have we used? We've used six, so we've got six left. Now, where can we start to put them? Okay, so let's look at if we put them all on the oxygen, so that oxygen has an octet. We've used all six, and we have oxygen's octet two, four, six, eight. So that looks good, right? Does carbon have a full octet? Two, four, six. Okay, that doesn't work. So we've got to take something away from there. What if we fill carbon's octet, and we fill the rest of electrons? We've used two, four, six, eight around carbon, 10, 12 total. We've used the total number of electrons that we need. Carbon has a full octet, but does oxygen have a full octet? No. So our solution then is to, to add a double bond. So we're going to take these electrons and move them into a bond right here. 
Okay, so we're going to add a double bond. How many electrons are represented in each of these bonds? Two in each, so we've got four electrons there total. Okay, so now let's go ahead and count the total number of electrons we've used. We've used two, four, six, and eight. Ten, twelve electrons. That's what we were supposed to do. Let's count oxygen's octet. Two, four, six, and eight. So that's good. And we count carbon's octet. Two, four, six, and eight. So there's our solution. Okay, so if on page 188 in your textbook, if you flip to page 188, number 6B tells us uh, kind of the rules for double bonds. If too many electrons have been used, subtract the lone pairs uh, until the number of valence electrons are correct. Then we can move one to a bond, and, and that kind of gives you a little bit more structure as far as when to add a double bond and that kind of thing. But you have to just kind of test and see. Lewis structures tend to be kind of a trial and error situation. Okay, there's always one answer. You can always check yourself, but sometimes it takes a little while to get to that final answer. Okay. Okay, if I were to give you a molecule that has a charge, okay, let's say I wanted a Lewis structure of phosphate. What's phosphate? Minus three. Okay. So if I was looking at valence electrons of this phosphate molecule, I would take phosphorus, which has five, oxygen, which has six, and there's four of those. And then what do I do about this guy? Do I have three extra electrons or three less electrons? Less. I have a negative three charge, so I need to add three more electrons for that negative three charge. So when I go into adding valence electrons, that charge is going to make a difference. Okay, if I would have a positive charge, then I would take away one of my valence electrons that I would have to represent. Does that make sense? Okay, I, that's all I need to cover on that part. We don't need to go ahead and draw it, but I wanted to, to indicate when there's a charge, it changes the number of valence electrons. Okay.